Hi, everybody. Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's The Business Program. I'm Cal Penn. I'm an actor, producer, uh, author of the new book, You Can't Be Serious. And before we're joined by our guest today, I want to let you know that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG After artists. This conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Over the past year, the foundation has raised over $6.5 million in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. If you're a sag after art and really need help, please ask. And if you can, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video. Thank you for your support. And now, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce director and producer and a good friend and mentor of mine, Mira Nair. Hello, hello, Cal. Hey, how are <laughs> it's you? It's a great pleasure to be here and to speak with you on the announcement, especially at the res I have it right here with me. Your amazing book that uh, just came to my door the, with all the vodka and all the goings on within it. <laughs> Thank you for, for, for all the members who are watching. I sent uh, I sent a couple of swag boxes with a vodka partner for my book uh, that that <laughs> you got. I'm glad you got it. I was gonna I was gonna text stalk you to see. Uh, oh, yes. I loved it. I loved it. I'm still to, going to uh, immerse myself more fully in it, but it's it's a big piece of work, and, and I really commend you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hope you like it. Uh, I, I, this, uh, that's actually a good segue, because you'll you'll notice, and I know I've told you this, that there's, uh, there's a big section in the book about how uh, much of an influence your films, especially Mississippi Masala, were on me as an aspiring actor. So I guess the first question is, for you as an aspiring artist, can you talk a little bit about where you were born, where you grew up, and what shaped your professional choices and ultimately your artistic vision? Um, I was born in Raurkila, Orissa, which is a tiny steel town in East India, uh, where my father was amongst the first uh, carders uh, after the British were thrown out of our country, thankfully, in uh, 1950, uh, that he began to be a part of the Indian civil service uh, uh, and was posted to this fairly remote state at that time in Orissa. I was born there, the youngest of uh, three children. I have two older brothers and they were my best uh, training to be a filmmaker because I had to really solidly deserve my audience right from day one. <laughs> <laughs> I was the teased, younger, unspoiled female, you know, in a in a rambunctious home. Right. Um, and uh, but and the extraordinary thing about living in Orissa, which is a city then uh, in Bhubaneswar, which was the capital, which was a city of two thousand temples and you know tall grass growing around them, and and the first airport put in when I was eight years old, the first movie theater when I was ten years old. So it was really a little bitty space, town in one sense, and yet it had the living ancient tradition of these temples and these extraordinary dance form called Odissi. Uh, you know, I would see, see great Odissi dancers just rehearse in those living temples, literally growing up. And so there was this extraordinary presence of an ancient space uh, at the same time as I was seeing a new India being created, a free India. Um, and I would say that that uh, was my earliest influence, the, the inequity between those who have and those who have not. You know, and and the and the very powerful uh, stories of the oral tradition. That one of the first influences was the traveling mythological theater that would come through town, our village, really, uh, where you know, in an empty space with just a prop or two and lots of hashish, there would be great tales being told from the old books, you know, and I would go with my driver because none of people didn't really go there. This was for the villagers, this was for the rural, this was for the, you know, the people not like us in a sense. And yet there was this throbbing, extraordinary tradition of good over evil stories and song that transported me. Later, Peter Brook was to look at this tradition of Jatra, it's called, to make his Mahabharat, to make a number of his plays, in fact, later on. So those were the early, early influences. Um, uh, but most of all, a world that was a cheek by jowl about injustice and inequity and, you know, those who had with those who didn't. And was that, what, seeing all of that, did uh, that initially, uh, if I recall correctly, it, it, you started out wanting to be an actor 
Was that yeah. right? Was that based on those uh, on, on seeing those plays? It was based on uh, some of that, although the Jatra tradition was very far from where I was, which was much more in an anglicized space. We went to an English medium school, we studied Shakespeare, we studied Robert Frost, I mean, that type of thing. Uh, but I was from the age of say 13 on, very happy on stage. I was intuitively a performer and, and um, I went to an Irish Catholic boarding school, a convent in Simla in the mountains. And there because of my height and my kind of baritone, I was always playing the man. I played the man for several years. You know, <laughs> I was daddy long legs and captain in HMS Pinafore and always the man because it was an all girls school. Uh, but there used to be this extraordinary theater troupe that would come through our schools uh, of Shakespeareana, Jeffrey Kendall, actually Felicity Kendall and uh, the, the great actress from England, her father and her their family who would come doing a medley of Shakespeare just four actors would transform a room and go through Macbeth to Julius Caesar in, in you know, two hours. And um, that was a huge eye opener. And I, that definitely was a major influence in what led me to seek that path. So I was, I joined a repertory company in Calcutta with Badal Sharkar, who was a radical Bengali playwright. And we created, much like in the movie tradition of Mike Lee, we, we would create plays together. Uh, you know, political apathy was one subject uh, and so on, several. And then we'd, perf we'd perform these plays in the streets of Calcutta in that case and Delhi later. Uh, so I came from a combination of that kind of theater to more um, proscenium theater, you know, that was to do for, with Shakespeare through comedies, through uh, Jean-Claude Van Italy or Peter, you know, Joseph Chaikin, or uh, those were the heroes for me at that time, Grotowski. Um, you know, this is when I was like say 17, 18 in Delhi University. Yeah. But under the illusion that I was an academic, I, I applied for, for, for scholarships to come abroad when okay. I was 18, 19. And uh, I had been offered one to Cambridge University in England, but I had, a chip on my shoulder about the Brits. I, I, I used to tell my mother that if I was born during the British, you know, Raj in India, I would definitely have been an anarchist. And, uh, you know, I would I'm definitely a troublemaker. And uh, so I did not want to go. I did not want to go to England for my further education like the rest of India used to want to do. Um, but instead, long story, but, uh, but, People don't believe me. I saw Love Story and I saw the movie and I and I thought, oh, that place that Ryan O'Neill was cavorting about with Ali McGraw in uh, looked rich enough to perhaps have me. And uh, and you know, I applied to a bunch of colleges and and basically got a full scholarship in only one college, and that turned out to be Harvard. And 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 because my father was very. Um, you know, um, impressed that the Kennedys had gone there. He let me go. He, I was the first in the family to leave the country uh, at the age of about 18. Yeah. And, and what was, uh, by the way, the, re the reason that I was laughing is that the, 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 a lot of my friends say that I, as the, as the son of immigrants and the grandson of, of Gandhian, uh, you know, protesters, that I have a chip on my shoulder about the Brits. So I, that's what I, I just sort Welcome. of, the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, can you, I, I, given the background as an actor and your and your interest in theater, especially with with those roots in in where you grew up, can you talk us through the years at Harvard and then how you made the jump into directing and specifically? I mean, you you began your career in in documentary filmmaking. Was that a preferred mode of storytelling as a choice, or was it just something you fell into? Well, at Harvard. This was the Harvard before Robert Brustein, you know, ran the, uh, the theater. Uh, everything in the theater was extracurricular. So in the first year, I played Arcadina in The Seagull. I played Evita Peron. I, I played as much as I could in the, on the stage. But I had to do that in addition to getting my, you know, it was all extracurricular. I never got credit for it. And, and I had to work 20 hours a week as a dishwasher and do whatever else. So I, I, had, I couldn't cope with the theater that was not credited. And I had to study something different. I took a course in photography, which is a really big, a huge power and influence in my life. Uh, and I felt that the 
course in photography enabled me to see the world as I wanted it, you know, visually, but not engage with the people behind my frame, you know, and I wanted that so much. So when I looked in the university, there was a lovely program where you could take courses in several colleges. I found a course in Cinema Verite Filmmaking at MIT next door, uh, which, which of all people, Ricky Leacock, uh, the great pioneer of the handheld camera, along with D.A. Pennybaker, who would often come to MIT to that class, uh, I took that course. And that pretty much put me on a different, wonderful path of being able to work with life, you know, to being able to observe life in all its, well, you could say inequities and ups and downs, but to work visually and to engage. So Cinema Verite and the study of cinema, truth cinema, as it literally translates to in, Fran in French, um, was a turning point. I began to major in that type of form of documentary telling where you enter people's lives eventually with a camera, don't, manipu you know, not, don't manipulate what you see, but let the story and the characters and the world reveal itself. So you have to have a lot of patience and you have to have a lot of um, conviction that the path you're going on will yield something, you know. So that was my first, I, I, I made my own first film at college I had as a thesis. And then um, I found myself always coming back to India for the work I had to do, you know. So for seven years after graduation, I, um, I, I made films from, of, of subjects that I wanted to explore, like what divides a, uh, what is the line that divides a good woman from a so-called bad woman in our society? And that led me to make India Cabaret, uh, one of my films in 19, in, in the early eighties, um, you know, where I lived with uh, cabaret dancers who are essentially strippers who, uh, who are just extraordinary human beings living in a very patriarchal uh, society of double, riddled with double standards. And I, you know, lived with them, was seen as one of them and then uh, started talking and recording the male customer who would come often to the club, a middle-class businessman. And then alcohol being my best friend in that film because he was always drunk, I convinced him to let me go home with him and live with him and his wife and his extended family for, for weeks, months. <laughs> and then this film became a menage, you know, become like a triangle, eternal triangle Indian style, you know, of the, so the woman who has respectability, the woman who's outside it. And, and, and the man or the society that could be helping in making that decision between who is who. But when you hear their dreams and you hear their dreams, the women, uh, you, you wonder who is more free, who is, who is free, you know, the woman with respectability or the woman who doesn't want it. You know? right. <laughs> uh, so uh, that, 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 that was the exploration and many such films. Um, until I, I got tired of, uh, of wanting, you know, looking for audiences for these documentaries. They were successful. They were on television sometimes. They uh, sometimes offended people. They, they made them curious, whatever. But I didn't have the audiences that I wanted, you know. And that led me to take the principles, really, of Cinema Verite and make fiction uh, more. Uh, but a fiction that was an amalgam of the electricity of everyday life, you know, with more control over the narrative, over the gesture, over the light, over the performance, over the intention, you could even say. But try to make a cinema that was uh, electric and alive, like the best of life is, you know, like the, I always say truth is stranger than fiction, you know, to, to, to be able to capture that unpredictability and that electricity with a, a certain amount of, um, you know, language and and poetry and 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 gesture and performance you know so that and that was my entry into my first feature film salam bombay which was you know a, a, a fairly unflinching but phosphorescent look at the lack of self pity at the flamboyance of the literally hundreds of street kids that one sees and meets in bombay they come to that city because of the promise of the golden dream, you know, because it's the celluloid city of India. Uh, and, and then how they grasp for a childhood that they have, you know, that has been denied to them. Uh, and, and anyway, so that became the first feature film uh, that was really an amalgam in, in several ways of, of working with people on the street, real folks, and slipping in actors to become inhabiting of that world and trying to create a, 
alchemy between that that really had a notion of truth uh, and, and, and you know in a in a in a world that you know from india uh, uh, however poor however whatever it might be it's also phosphorescent it's also alive it's incredibly vibrant and there's almost a community of you know people who live on the margins of nothing you know so it's it's never just despair it's always a seesaw you know and that was what the aspiration was to to capture in salam bombay in the in the fragility and in the incredible inspiration really of the resilience of street kids were you i'm i'm curious uh if you expected the reception that salam bombay received and i guess it's a it's sort of a two uh, i'm of two minds in asking that question one from your perspective obviously as a as a director a relatively new director and then secondly you know as as actors i'm sure everybody watching you know you you have an episode of something come out you have a film come out and you do that dance between uh, should i read the reviews or should i not read the reviews you know and yeah. do the reviews to the reviews of my performance reflect the the days that i've spent on the set the narrative that i've crafted especially since that was really that it got i mean you 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 were nominated for an oscar out, right out of the gate yeah. Well, yeah. How how did things progress from there, and was that and was that something that did you know you had something that special as you were making it? Oh no! When you were and I was making it, it was really one of those life and death movies. You never never thought of the fruits of the action. <laughs> uh, you know, it was one of those movies where I would work all day and then get on the phone at night with Europe and the time zones helping me uh, to get money for the next day of shooting. you know it was not like it was not it was a bunch of all of us first timers you know at the game from sunil tarapurwala my best friend from college who wrote the screenplay and you know to to sandy sissel the wonderful cinematographer who had shot some commercials and wonderful stuff and documentaries but never made a feature so we were all first timers um in a very um literally on the streets 52 locations 52 days of shooting and no no uh, budget to be speaking of so it was it was never a question of of uh, dreaming of plaudits and laudits you know while making it it was truly brutal making it um and uh, and frankly i had never even been to a feature film festival forget about you know knowing what i could do with it you know and 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 i remember we were in Can- uh, in in france finishing the film because i uh, the, one of the producers was french and we had to spend post production in france and we and and i remember you know gil jacob and the director the, the main official film se- section of can insisting on wanting it and the director's fortnight which is the younger first time filmmakers also wanting it and everybody wanting it and i didn't even know at that time that that was like the uh, epitome of <laughs> the thrill but anyway we we went with the first time director director's fortnight and you know it was a fairy tale really we were the last night of the festival it was a 30 minute ovation um you know they, they introduced all the directors who had ever shown their movies there and then introduced me as the youngest baby of the kanzen uh, and this was before all the movements so they could call me the youngest baby and and <laughs> and 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 then within 24 hours of showing the film we we had sold the whole world and wow. in a, and an indian film had never been seen by the whole world <laughs> leave alone had commercial distribution for it you know so um so it was but it was all a kind of eye opener uh, kal you know i didn't and then as a result of that i had to go i was on the road for 9 months uh, set, you know promoting the film and and talking about the film and really getting an education on publicity and you know and 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 kind of carrying that mantle myself because the kids the street kids they they couldn't come out they only came out around the promotion of the film in india uh, it was too complicated to bring them anywhere and 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 i had to sort of be the bridge you know to even making this film be seen in the rest of the world anyway so it was a long and beautiful and uh, unexpected road you know and 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 the i think for me one of the greatest parts of it was to be able to take the profits of the film and make salam balak 
Trust, which is our uh, nonprofit Street Kids Foundation in India. Now it's 33 years old and it's, it spons- it's provides a home and shelters for you know, more than 5,000 street kids a year, every year in India so far. So that was a big part of the goal in the beginning of Making Salam is can art change the world? Can we do something that really can impact people's lives? And it cannot happen often, you and I know that in our careers and in our world, but it did happen with Salam Bombay, you know, and it continues to happen. And that is a great uh, thing, you know. Anyway, so that's, that was what happened, uh, you know, in all those, in about the two, three years that it took to open the film in the whole world. Wow. And the, the follow-up to that, uh, or your, your next film, rather, was Mississippi Masala. Is, is yeah. that right? And I want to... We're at the 30 year anniversary. So congratulations first. For Thank you. That. I had the chance to come to one of the screenings in New York. That was an incredible evening. Um, that film, I know uh, most of the people watching know that film. Uh, that had a very young Denzel and uh, Sarita Chaudhary. And one of the questions that I know people wanted me to ask you that there's this long list of actors, international actors that you've worked with over the years, uh, Roshan Seth, Tabu, Irfan, uh, Uma Thurman, uh, and yeah. John Houston, uh, Reka, let's see, who else? It's really such a, oh, and- Nasiruddin, Nasiruddin, my greatest love. And Lupita, <laughs> Lupita is on this list, and I'm just gonna take a pause to say, she interned on The Namesake, is that right? Absolutely, she was my assistant uh, on The Namesake for over a year. At our, at our film company. And uh, in fact, I wrote her first visa letter to come to the United States. <laughs> Amazing. When I wrote to her, to we wrote Harriet uh, Mutesi for her, for Lupita to do uh, in Queen of Katwe, my last film, uh, or two films ago. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I just, I mean, she loved it and wanted to do it immediately. But I, I was almost going to say, I have first dibs, baby. I you know, <laughs> brought, brought you here. Uh, no, she, she was a uh, great, uh, she worked with us on the namesake, if you remember, and looked as striking as she looked now. I mean, and then she was, her first film was shot in my film school, Maisha, uh, the great uh, non non-prof- the free school we have in East Africa, where she served as a coordinator. And then, of course, the students cast her. So I have a lovely, colorful history with yeah. Lupita. Yeah. The question I have for you about all of these people, and then even the ones who's, who maybe aren't as, as much of, of household names, the performances in your films are intimate and incredible. And I guess I'm, I'm curious what the, what the markers of a successful actor are for you. And if you can, to, to the extent that you have a process casting wise, if you can share that with the, the actors who are watching. Well, one of the great uh, lessons of making Cinema Verite, uh, as, uh, the way I ma- made it or the way we were taught to make, is to observe life, is to observe people, is to is to gain their trust also. You know, why would a dancer let her into your life if you if she doesn't trust you? Why would she open herself up? So that ability to, for even as a director, to create that trust, to create that space, to make us all play, literally play, you know, to play the fool if need be, to uh, to create a, a safe space where you can take risks and fall on your face. That is very essential for the director first to create, you know, and that creation is different with different films, you know. Um, since I work a lot with so-called non-actors meeting great legendary actors like in Queen of Katwe or Monsoon Wedding. I mean, it's always that, you know, Nasiruddin Shah opposite my nephew, you know, or so and so, you know, uh, Lupita or David Oyelo opposite, you know, 20 kids who really sleep and street, you know, live in Katwe, you know. Um, but I, really, or even Denzel and Sarita, you know, Sarita w- had never faced a camera before. So um, it's my task to create a space that makes you all bloom firstly, makes you all, you know, take that leap. And it is to, it is to create an atmosphere of, of safety and somewhat trust and also irreverence. And for me, fun is everything. <laughs> um, but in, in, in finding, in looking for an, an actor or for the real person to play the character, um, 
I am very interested in uh, humility. I am very interested in the, the, the possibility in the actor to listen beautifully because listening is a lot of absorbing what later becomes a performance. Um, I have really, uh, I need to have the place an ego, which is vital to performance, but to be placed out of the frame so that we all assume the ego, but we enter the membrane of that character to be. Um, and to, of course, I'm spoiled by all your abilities and everybody's abilities. They're so extraordinary. And of course, to marshal that skill, you know, into the performance uh, while retaining the listening, the humility, the lack of ego, but to have, of course, the skill to trans take it to the stage. M many people I have to help getting there and many people, of course, I don't have to help much except to, except to be a kind of load star of, for the journey, you know. Um, but what I love to do is to cast the real people with the, with the movie stars sometimes. And that for me has always proved, a, given me a great alchemy, you know, that creates a truth and creates an unpredictability and creates something that is beyond shtick, you know, like beyond tricks of the trade, you know. Uh, so that's, that's the journey I go on. And I think keeping it all semi-real, but superbly skilled is very important. And then one, one, one step even before the process of working with actors, uh, the casting process, what advice do you have for actors in the audition process itself? I think to not be afraid of stillness, hmm. to be in, in your being, you know, and it's damn tough these days because of Zoom. Everybody I'm seeing now, I'm seeing hundreds of actors because I'm casting National Treasure, but I am blown away by the extraordinary ability and the talent I'm seeing across all ages. And because of Zoom, I'm seeing them from literally everywhere in the world, you know. Uh, uh, but but it's a very it's a really tough uh, medium that they are singularly, uh, uh, you know, uh, lifting the bar on in many ways. But um, I think a, a, a sort of a stillness that allows you to reveal who you are rather than a frenetic kind of mm -hmm. anxiety to please, you know, that's something that I find it's very difficult, you know, to get beyond because we are, the whole culture teaches you to please and to reveal and to be an open book and to be cheerful and to be nice and to have energy. But sometimes <laughs> it takes away or does not reveal the core of what makes one person special and powerful and distinctive over the other person. So I, I, I look for that, but I basically look to be convinced, you know, I look to, uh, be, uh, uh, to be able to recognize in the actor the spirit of what I'm looking for, you know, and what I love is mystery. You know, what I love is when they hold their cards closer to their chest and slowly the unfolding will happen rather than everything at one time, you know, um, because that's enigma and enigma is what keeps you rooted to the screen, you know, and, and that's what I think makes movie stars. It's this kind of ineffable quality, you know, where nothing is as it may seem, you know, it's one thing, but it could be another thing, you know? Um, and I think for, in a lot of the great actors or stars I know and have acted with, uh, worked with, uh, there is that quality, but there's also that extraordinary facility. Like you can be, it's amazing. You know, when I think of Reese Witherspoon in Vanity Fair, uh, she was, as we kept progressing uh, through, the, through the film, she was pregnant. And, and we, and fortunately, Becky Sharp also was pregnant in a part of the story. So I was using with her blessing and permission, uh, her to play this, you know, pregnant character. And there was a scene that I wanted them to, uh, to, to, to do a little sort of almost harem-esque belly dance, you know, uh, uh, in the courts of early 19th century at that time, just, just to have an allusion to the empire that, that was going on. And there was, you know, a, a, a pregnant actor who was so, so skilled and so amazing, but also the fatigue of being a mom or whatever, 
it was out the window and there was Reese. You, I mean, beyond, you couldn't even see or feel that she was carrying anyone as she, you know, completely learned the sinuous moves and threw herself into literally the, the, the sauciness, the style of a dancer at that time, you know, uh, you know, and, and I was just struck by the, uh, by the sort of uh, ability to harness the skill, you know, with that type of spirit and passion of a dancer of that. I mean, I, you know, that's, that's extraordinary, the kind of way to conserve your energy to explode at the moment that we need it, you know, but in a very distinct way. Anyway, there's so many examples of how actors, you know, impress me with their energy. And then it comes to the fact that I just love actors. You know, I don't, I am, I was one, I am one. I, I don't uh, judge, uh, judging or demanding is never the way, you know. It's how do, how do I create a space in which everyone can bloom and especially the actor. By the time we're with the actors, uh, everything else must be done. And that inspiration, that, that ability to really just be focused on you and what you do. And, you know, I think that's a sacred thing. And, and, and I think that it has to be preserved so that I can get what I want, you know, uh, and with you giving me everything you got, you know, towards that vision, you know, and you know, we've done it before you and I, and, and it's a, it's a very beautiful, delicate, I think, respectful process. Uh, but, but one that has to be preserved uh, and, and changed also with every actor because actors are human beings and they are not, uh, they, they need to be, it's, there's no one way at all. I, hearing you uh, talk about that, especially the earlier, <clears throat> the earlier part, uh, uh, just about about uh, you know we we're we're in a business that especially right now just wants high energy and and everything just like immediately show show me instead of show me be everything. Covered. Yeah, I, I'm reminded of two scenes in the namesake in particular that we worked on that just your directing style floored me in a way that I was so happy with. Uh, and those two scenes are when uh, when I go uh, back into um, my dad's apartment after Irfan's character passes away and collapse on the bed. Uh, and I remember we shot that in Yonkers. It was in an apartment complex. It was all practical sets. And uh, and I came in and there was nobody there. It was just you, Fred Elms, our DP. Um, and there was a, a boom that was there. And you said, uh, we're going to go outside right now you take as much time as you want. And when you're ready to start the scene, open the door and give me four beats so that Fred can turn the camera on. Uh, and then whenever you're ready, you can, you can go ahead. And I just thought you've given me the gift of time and the gift of time in, in making film is just not something you're usually given by a director. And I, I'm obviously as a producer now mindful of the, the cost considerations and everything that goes into that. But if you had not given me that gift of time, I just don't know what that scene would have felt like. You know, I could tell you what it looked like, but you were going for feeling. You were going for the authenticity of what that meant and when it was the right moment for me to open that door. The, the second thing that it reminded me of was there's a scene that uh, Irfan and I do in the car when I when Gogol finds out about the origin story of his name. That scene is played almost entirely in silence the real beats of that scene for me are silence that, that you fostered that obviously are fun can com communicate, uh, you know, paragraphs with a look, um, but it's a rarity. And it, it, so, so to hear you lay out exactly how that comes into play with all of your work, I just, those were two of the things that just jumped out at me for, for people who have not worked with you that are, were such a treat with, with the namesake and putting, putting that film together as an actor. So thank, thank you, you Kel. Yeah. Thank you, Kel. A lot of it comes from being in the moment in life, you yeah. know, in knowing and in 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 seeing and and being with people. You know, in grief has its own rhythm. You know, there is no one way. You know, so uh, it's just when one strives to have an effect of something that it strikes as false. So that I try to avoid anything that rings false, you know. And uh, although truth comes in so many different ways and forms, that's the main thing is the barometer of, yeah. of, 
of truth for me. And, and a lot of what is revealed is actually in silence. If, if actors, if the mood, if everyone is imbued in the correctness, in the rightness of things. And that is my work to create that atmosphere. But, but, and then to, you know, and then to listen to my own instinct about what I'm getting, receiving from you all, you know, uh, not to trust it because, uh, I have you with me and, and I can ask you, you know, whichever way I can ask you to go to another place with it. I do. It's not like I'm, uh, you know, shy <laughs> because I know, uh, but not to ask you to take me to the end, not to state the end, but to find a key that will help you to get me to what end I want, you know? So it's an elusive, uh, journey. It's not a journey that is at all prescriptive or prescribed or one way. Um, but it is, you have to, you have to find that uh, kind of humanity of connection with the actor, you know, um, so that you can get what you need. I want to go back to Mississippi Masala because you had, uh, you had Denzel who had had some films under his belt, even though he was a relative newcomer. And then you had Sarita who had not been on camera before and they are amazing together i mean the chemistry that they have in that film is is brilliant how did you foster something like that and and how did they run with it well uh i it was all quite step by step i mean i've first of course had denzel before anyone else you know and and i I got Denzel because he loved Salam Bombay, because he loved the first film. Uh, and he he trusted me, actually, that was the word he used, because he said, I, I just know how to work with actors and, and the world that he saw. But secondly, the, the story we were presenting him, uh, he said he would never see again, he would never have it ever, you know, it's such a original thing, the Asian, uh, the, the sort of interracial love story between an African-American and an Asian African, you know. Um, and uh, so those were the two things. But so I decided to always include him in the search for Mina, in the search for what would lead me to Sarita. I had seen five pages of Sarita as a model in some magazine in England. And I really loved that sort of the, her her beauty, but also her intelligence and her lack of vanity that I sort of felt in those pictures. I shared them with Denzel. He, you know, he he sort of shrugged positively and 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 you know said to go on my way. You know, you know he wasn't going to uh, say one thing or another. It was just pictures. And then I went out to find her, and uh, and and when I found her through my casting director, when sorry, are you? I had not met her yet at that time. No, uh, I set out to find her uh, and, and of course, meeting lots of other people, lots of other actresses, you know, in every place, you know, but I always had her in my mind. And I asked Susie Figgis, my casting director, to find that girl with the hair, as I called it, like I called her. And anyway, she, Susie found uh, uh, Sarita on a bicycle in London being a student of film, a theory, not acting. You know, and um, and anyway, when I auditioned her, it was funny because she came with oily hair and Susie sent her right out to a salon. She says, no, no, no. She's obsessed with your wild hair. And I'd like you to be, you know, as wild as you were. In the whatever. Anyway, that was another story. So she got the part because she, because of her everything, you know, her. And, and, and then I just invited um her to come to New York and, and, and Denzel was uh, there too. And we, just the three of us, you know, got into my one room office and just read the part, talked, you know, laughed, but, but not too much bonhomie or camaraderie, just more a long working session where I could see them physically in the same space and just the interaction. And that was it. That was the cinch, you know, that it worked so beautifully and he was happy and everything. I mean, it was not his decision to make, but he was very involved. He was very happy with the decision. And then we met pretty much, I'd say, on the set. The thing about working with non, you know, first timers is that I don't try to do it too much beforehand. You know, I, I just try to create an atmosphere where it's 
where where the questions have been asked you know where where you you can talk you know but then in terms of rehearsing uh, we do it pretty much on the set and and both of them i think were fairly close to the spirit of their characters so it wasn't like i had to fully teach them how to be especially sarita you know um but it was the and i moved the love stuff the the real heat of it to the very end of the film so okay. that both of them could be totally in their worlds um you know f- uh, in the industrious uh you know older brother he played the 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 businessman the carpet cleaner the you know the the the, the guy trying to hold his family together and and uh Sarita you know dealing with the, uh, you know Mina dealing with the lack of her independence and just her world and how small it was and how she dreamed of a larger life all that was in their dna by the time we came to the love stuff you know and then it was a question of just preserving that um trust and preserving that intimacy that had been built but now would be allowed to go into the physical more physical zone you know um and it was very beautiful i just kept hoping that i could contain it and to keep it not to let it dissipate you know um so yeah i can tell you lots of stories but 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 uh it was very much about that the fact that they were both almost from the real worlds that they were showing that they were you know playing i mean how how did that how did the idea for that film come about because i'm 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 thinking you know about it it was uh hollywood has certainly changed since those days but even today i feel like if somebody had said uh okay we have two ideas for a film one is about street kids in mumbai and the other one's about you know uh this this love story between uh, an african american man and a and a indian african uh American woman in Mississippi I still feel like that's a tough sell in Hollywood how did how did it come together and how did you sell it was you know what what was that story I'm, I'm still tough selling man I'm still nothing is easy because we are doing things still you know that have not been seen or not first time or whatever so it depends on the content um Uh, the the idea for mississippi masala came from being from came from being in college in cambridge massachusetts uh, this brown girl myself between black and white communities in 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 cambridge you know invisible and accessible to both but yet yet you know palpable lines uh, that divided us sometimes um and i and i wanted to speak of that in some way you know about the hierarchy of color as i thought about it in my mind um and then i after soon after making salam bombay when i had be offered every children's film about children of every hue <laughs> for several months after the success of salam um and turned them all down i, I was sensible enough i returned to that idea of the hierarchy of color and i had read uh, you know i had meanwhile read about i'd never been to africa in any way the entire continent but i had read about the asian expulsion by idi amin in 1972 of you know indians who had never known india who had been three generations there and were suddenly asked to leave and i also read in this tabloid we used to have called india now this local indian newspaper in in america uh i read the strange fact of how so many ugandan asian exiles came straight to mississippi because it was dirt poor and they could buy motels for $14000 at the time and they could they could you know bring their entire families with them uh to run the motel to work the motel they wouldn't have to hire anyone else and 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 they would you know we as especially uh, you know from where we come to rent is anathema and to buy is everything so to be able to buy your business soon after being exiled uh, was a big draw and i thought how peculiar that you can't find an american motel american owned motel in in the south but you can only find indian owned motels of people who have fled the african continent to you know to come to a place which was essentially african american and where of course the encounter between the african american community of those who had obviously never been to africa in this strange trick of history that their 
they are meeting and sort of relying on each other for to make a living you know today you know so then i took that idea the promise of that idea i just sort of said what if uh, you know what if love happens you know what if a, a girl who really does not think of a black person as a anything other than her own kind you know falls in love with that person with the, but the society would just go berserk you know it would never understand this you know so that's what was the seed of the idea and and then i went on you know uh, spent about 6 months uh, in motels with suni tarapurwala uh, my writer who had written salam bombay and 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 just sort of really hung out with those who had who lived that life and and because we also kept hearing about uganda from them and and uh, we i decided to i have got to go to this place that they dream about you know and that lo- led us to go to uganda in 89 to research the the dream uh, what what did they dream about you know and that these homes these papayas these fertility the, the the way they had built it up in their mind you know um so that you know uh, those days and sometimes still i the screenplays come out of this kind of almost social science research you know of literally those worlds you know over months and of time and uh, meeting characters who live that life it's very much i think that cinema varite tradition you know and then suni and i really share a sensibility and a, also a sense of humor very mischievous sense of humor and and we uh, you know and then we concocted a, a, a possible what i call a map of life what could happen uh, and then she wrote the screenplay and and i was around to shepherd all of it to you know uh, to a place where we could then get it financed and we it was difficult to get financed you know the story i told you that day of you know i mean the head of the studio they wanted me because salam bombay was a, actually a real major hit uh, the oscars were behind us all that stuff i had the trappings of success uh, and harvard always made them look feel good that you know they oh yeah she's one of ours you know not just a foreigner <laughs> but when it came to mississippi masala and even with denzel washington it was still difficult because those were not uh, the era of black movies had not yet begun even though they had begun but they had not yet been accepted as such and um, and i was literally asked point blank you know can't you make room for a white protagonist you know and and i and i and i loved the 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 the, the cadence of that sentence you know make room for a white protagonist every word was very interesting because the protagonist is central and make room means that there's no room for it so like let's just change the story you know and and i um, laughed and said you know uh, all the i promise all the waiters in the film will be white you know and he laughed i laughed and i was shown the door but but the thing is i have the ability to see through this stuff you know yeah. and I, also the sense to understand that that kind of rejection gives me courage you know gives me more energy although it, it's hard it's totally hard and it's very lonely at the time but but it make, makes me feel like i'm doing something right um, but but what has been really uh, lovely in this 30th anniversary and the remastering of the film and the opening at the new york film festival and i was just yesterday day before eva duvernay presented it to a totally sold out audience in los angeles and and to see the young just eat it up i mean it's so it's a funny sexy political mixture of something that has yet not been seen again you know and it's very much about now and what we are dealing with you know so i'm very uh, happy to see the film stand up uh, all these years later and to be welcomed you know in a in a in a time when people are craving this but are still not getting it enough I mean that that's well said that's that, you know I'm a big fan of that film for since I was uh Other since, reason, yeah. you're preaching to the preaching to the choir there uh I'm I'm curious when you switched gears for something like Vanity Fair uh you know adapting a a, a well-known novel or tackling a project like that I know you you talked about Reese a little bit but um did you view that as a departure from something you had done before or was it all based on story and story that you were passionate about 
I have to have a point of view uh, about the, especially books, you know, that we are adapting or I'm wanting us to adapt. And with Vanity Fair, which is a novel I loved uh, since I was 16 in that Irish Catholic convent, because this was a badass girl, Becky Sharp, you know, and I loved that badass girl. And and so I loved her for a long time. So when, when uh, Focus Features offered me Vanity Fair after the success of Monsoon Wedding, I, I said yes, uh, even though it had been made so many times before in several series and whatever, I didn't see all the versions, but, uh, but because I felt that uh, Thackeray, you know, who was born in Calcutta and was definitely an outsider to his own British society. He, he, he saw England when he was 14 for the first time. He, I think he wrote that novel with the eyes of an outsider, like I am, you know, in the sense that he wrote it understanding that social hierarchy in England was turning upside down uh, because of the money that was flooding in from the colonies. You know, the empire was raping the colonies and that money was flooding London, creating a, a businessmen and mercantile people and middlemen and, and a society that was no longer just about class and who is so-and-so and who, you know, who inherited what. Uh, and that created Be Becky Sharp, uh, that upwardly, you know, aspiring mobile, you know, girl who didn't, uh, who, who didn't take no for an answer. Um, so that's the view I liked. And, and that's the view I thought I could bring that would be special, you know. Uh, and then, uh, and it was a, it was a way of, you know, I love, uh, I love, uh, well, I'm a big student of literature, but I love, I love the drama of, 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 of human beings. And I also love these actors, you know, who, with whom I don't often get, inhabit worlds where I can cast a, you know, Elaine uh, Atkins, Eileen Atkins, or, or, or you know, or Reese, or, or so many uh, whom, you know, Bob Hoskins was in it, you know, and, and, and Gabriel Byrne, and, 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 you know, Jim Broadbent. I mean, these are geniuses in my view as well. And I rarely think of worlds where they can come in and inhabit. So it was a great chance for me also to play with the finest. What are some of the more surprising um, impacts that you've seen in, in the work that you've done? For example, I know that, you know, the uh, After Salam Bombay, the, the trust or uh, Maisha coming out of, you know, yeah. uh, being in, in Uganda. Are, are, there, are there other things like that that are that intersection of what we do as artists with what we have to do as humans? But, you know, I'm not, I just want to be clear that activism with art is not my, only my goal in life. You know, that's not what I'm proud. I mean, it's, I don't, I try not to be proud, period, but that's not what I th think is the greatest only, you know, for, because for me, the art one makes, the, 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 the vocabulary you work with, the, the, Hope, I mean, I can only say art now after years of trying to do it. It, you, it took me years to call myself an artist in that, in the deepest sense of the word. But the, the, the art one makes has the courage to be distinctive, to be who we truly are in the sense to be unafraid of our own poetry and our own music and our own language and therefore our own struggle. To make the specificity of that art so, such that the world can enjoy it. The world can see themselves in it. To to not be afraid of the loneliness while making it. You know, like you said, uh, if I would pitch Monsoon Wedding today as a, you know, uh, it's about a mad family who speaks four languages in one sentence, no one would touch it, you know. I mean, uh, but to find somehow the conviction and the bulldozing belief that one should make it, you know, and, and not know that it's going to be this or that, not know anything of the success or the failure of it, um, you know, and still re and make it, you know, fully and beautifully, like we did the namesake. The namesake is a, for me in my so-called canon, a, a play of, a, it's a film of perfection for me. It's exactly what I wanted it to be. And that is very hard to say as a, producer director you know because uh, there's so many people involved with our art and our craft right there's so many millions and everyone has a stake in it and if you have to be a game player team player collaborator whatever the euphemism they call it you know but it can get tampered with 
it's a very delicate thing and you can start chipping away at it and suddenly it's this flat piece of you know cold toast you know mm-hmm. and so when you can preserve something that is very itself then it's anyway namesake you know achieve that and and a few films of mine i can say that about um so that's a great achievement yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know but the other achievement if since you ask and i really don't like to think about achievements is is um is the ability to have love around me uh, to it, the ability to have uh, also created a family uh, and a and a and to preserve this feeling of um you know engagement with the world but creating good uh, good human beings you know to fuel the art because growing up i used to always read these biographies about the people i loved you know whether it be billy holiday or whether it be you know uh, steve biko or whatever you know I, i but i would always wonder is madness always going to be a part of it you know and is it possible to have something i don't mean i don't i question always what is normal it's not a question of normalcy but but to to have a to to nourish those uh, around you and to be nourished by them and to take that to harness that into your art is something very i'm grateful for but it needs work because you know our our life uh, when we make films it is so total that sometimes everything else can burn so for me the 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 power the 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 piece i have sometimes even though the pain keeps going like the struggle is no longer is not ever easy um is that i have that i i'm fueled by the nourishment of of family uh, around me as well as and and family is not just blood but family of artists family of 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 uh, like mind of of some people who believe that um Uh, you know that my that my instinct is valuable <laughs> but it's not always not always apparent for me when i have to, yeah uh i mean that that uh, that answer summed up literally six of the questions that they that they sent me in probably the most organic way so i i am appreciative of that were, were there were there any was there anything else that you wanted to talk about that we didn't that we didn't get to you know just that the the struggle continues completely you know uh because um i don't want to be the mainstream but when you're not in the mainstream and and when you're flirting with the mainstream you're always having to prove yourself at every moment you know but to what just just to find the strength in ourselves to continue to believe you know in what we are bringing to the world you know uh and our side of the world uh, you know what is the center of the world we have to constantly question that <laughs> i mean i feel like that's a perfect way to wrap up so i will just say thank you uh mira uh, on behalf of the sag after foundation i want to thank you for sharing your experiences your process and craft with your fellow performers and and with uh thank you universe. um and thanks to you all for uh, for joining us thank you thank you so much gal <laughs>